Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Annie. I'm a public services librarian at Kent County Public Library. And I am, as always, very excited to have Sabine Harvey from University of Maryland Extension here this morning. Today is the second in our four-part Get Ready to Garden series. Today's focus is gardening myths. We will be talking about debunking them. Um, we do also have two additional sessions coming up on February 5th, we will be talking about designing and redesigning garden space. And on February 12th, we will be focusing on container gardening and raised beds. If you would like to join us for those programs, you can register through the library's calendar. Um, and I will put the link for that into the chat box in case you don't have it. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this morning over to Sabine and we will get started learning about what's true about um, some of the around the, the common myths of gardening practices. We're going to dig into what's true and what isn't. Yes, gosh, and there's a lot of them. Um, yes, um, I hope I will will debunk some. I hope I hope um, that there will be some new information in here. Um, I got to this because, um, well, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll date myself here, but at some point, you know, watching a, um, uh, an NPR, um, you know, one of their fundraising things, and there's Jerry Baker with all his homemade concoctions, and it just all sounds wonderful and fantastic, and like, oh my goodness gracious, right? So, um, but yeah, I think we have learned, especially in recent years, that we really should look at what's true, what's not true, what's the science, what's the proof. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and, oh, hold on a second. Wouldn't it be nice if I actually, there we go, had something on there. Um, is this working, Annie? I am not seeing it, no. I am not seeing it either. I am not sure why that is. Let me, oh. There we go. Now it says it has started, started sharing. It is moving into the slide. Um, there? That is yes. perfect. We're good okay. to go. So, um, well, let's dive right into it. And here you go, all the fun stuff that I just, you know, that people say is so fantastic to use, readily available right there in your home. And um, so let's 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 see what you know. Baking soda. There is there is one. Um, people always say, oh, you know, we got to use baking soda on just about everything. Miracle thing. And um, I have a slide after this that will show you why it might work on, um, on certain fungal diseases. So, but basically that's the claim, right? It will work on fungal diseases. Um, well, they've done some research and yes, it will work on things like powdery mildew and no, it does not work on black spot on roses. Um, and in addition, they also found that it only works efficiently if you actually mix it with horticultural oil. It needs that extra boost. If you just use it in and of and by itself, then it really, um, I'll spray your plants with water because it really is not going to make a difference. Whether you think it or not, it's not. And why um, this, this, this can work, it actually doesn't cure the disease, but what it does is it, it changes the pH of the leaf surface. And so rather than a, a antifungal agency, it is called something that is fungistatic. So it, it, it kind of reaches a status quo. So what it does is it reaches it raises the uh, pH of the leaf surface and therefore 
the fungus cannot spread anymore. It doesn't cure it, it doesn't make it go away. It just makes an inhospitable um, environment by which certain diseases, not all, certain diseases cannot spread anymore. Okay, Epsom salt. Oh my goodness gracious, I had no idea. I had that here just in the house, you know, for actually for dogs who had like, you know, um, uh, stuff going on with their paws and we needed to soak their paws in something. Um, I was blown away by, by, by all the things that people say Epsom salt will do. Epsom salt is basically just a salt composed of two nutrients, magnesium and sulfur. Um, you know, it's often touted as a, um, as a fertilizer, as something to treat magnesium deficiency. Um, it says that it will deter pests, slugs, or voles, that it will make plants grow bushier, that it will also um, make more flowers. Well, they've done trials. None of that is true. It will address eventually um, a magnesium deficiency. However, most of the time when your plants suffer from a magnesium deficiency, it is because the soil is actually too acidic. So you could add magnesium, but it really isn't gonna make a difference. It could also be that there is too much potassium, in which case, uh, the level of potassium will inhibit the uptake of, of the magnesium. So if there's something wrong with your plants, the best thing to do is to do a soil test. And then usually, like if there's a magnesium deficiency, well, the soil test will show that your soil is too acidic. And instead, you would add lime and address the larger issue, which is the level of the pH of your soil. So who knew, right? Anyway, so Epsom salt, not exactly the, um, the cure-all for, for, it's not a magic ingredient. Um, vinegar, so there we go, vinegar, you know, often used to control weeds. Um, I always thought that it would also really alter the pH. Apparently that is not really the case. However, you know, our, our, our kitchen vinegar, it's 5% vinegar. So yes, you can use it to burn off the tops of weeds, but it won't kill the roots of, of, of any plant that you would like to kill. Um, so now apparently there is concoctions there out there that will combine um, vinegar, salt, and dish soap. There's another one. Um, now there, you are actually um, starting to venture into dangerous territory because that concoction, um, especially because of the salts, it will kill earthworms. Um, it might interfere with the structure of your soil. It will definitely do something to concrete, you know, think salt. Um, not too good for your eyes, if you were to get it in your eyes. And, uh, and then dish soap. Well, there's many different dish soaps out there, but there's one thing that most dish soaps have in common. And that is that it is a, a um, well, they also have, they have the greasers in them. You know, some of these dish soaps these days have lotions in them. And so what they do is they will stick to the surface of the, of the um, leaf and they will actually, you know, the surface of leaves has something that's called a cuticle and the dish soap will actually harm that cuticle. So you may end up with burnt leaves. And um, so once again, if you're gonna go like to dish soap, a better thing to do would be your horticultural oil because that has been specifically made you know, to be spread onto plants. Yes, it will cost a little bit more, but if you make up the balance, you know, damaged plants or the cultural oil, then in the end, you are gonna end up winning. 
So, um, so be careful. I guess my, my lesson here is that maybe one of these products in and of them by itself is okay. But when you start combining them, then you might run into trouble. Um, rubbing alcohol. Rubbing alcohol is actually pretty darn good. A lot of, um, you know, we have to be careful with disease, especially when you're um, doing pruning, for instance, with, with um, apple and pear trees that have fire blight, right? That's a bacteria. Um, or if you're, if you're um, pruning um, tomato plants or maybe something with a vi virus in it, and it will often say to disinfect your pruners, right? With bleach, and yes, it's a, it's a it's a um, diluted bleach. However, bleach is very very corrosive, especially on your tools. So it is a lot better to use rubbing alcohol rather than bleach. So the rubbing alcohol in this picture, it can stay. The rest, be careful with them. Now, one thing that I had no idea about: boric acid. I had no idea that people are using boric acid. So that is borax and you know, there's boron in there. You gotta be careful with that because you know, uh, when we have our house inspections, they are checked for boron um, because it's actually not a very nice substance. However, what I did not know is, and you guys are gonna be so, so very happy, apparently, Boric acid can control creeping Charlie, one of the banes of our existence. What a horrible, horrible weed. Um, and um, you obviously have to be careful with it because if you think about it, if it kills creeping Charlie, well, that is a dicot, right? Just like your desired plants. So if it's gonna kill creeping Charlie, it is just like, for instance, Roundup, it's going to kill everything else, you know, anything else that it will come into contact with. And apparently, um, citrus trees, stone fruit, and nut trees are very, very sensitive to boron, and it can move through the soil. So be careful with it. But what, I've, what I found from a uh, reputable website was that apparently, if you mix 10 ounces of borax, into four ounces of warm water. You then have like some sort of slurry. You need to mix that into another two and a half gallons of warm water. You could spray that over an area of 1000 square feet. Now, if you have a lot of um, Creeping Charlie there, it should kill the Creeping Charlie, but not your grass. So um, who knows? I, you know, I was just, I was just surprised by that. Sabine, there's a question in the chat oh, about sorry, what Creeping Charlie is yeah. and whether it's the same as garlic mustard. No, garlic mustard is a totally different plant. So garlic mustard is um, in the mustard family, right, in the cabbage family. It uh, forms a rosette one year and then the next year um, it will send up a flower stalk. And garlic mustard is actually, um, you know, has a white flower. It looks a lot like a cabbage flower. Um, if you touch the leaves, it will, um, you can smell the garlic. It's actually very edible. Um, I've made it in, you know, I've used it to, to, to um, you know, I put it into like some sort of greens dish. I've sauteed it. You can make it into pesto. So here there's a perfect case of an invasive weed, um, that you that is very edible. So eat your weeds um, if you know where they grow and that it's safe. Creeping Charlie is a weed in the mint family. So it has a square stem. It is very shallow. So garlic mustard goes up and it has a rosette and large leaves. Creeping Charlie is um, it, it it chucks along the ground. It doesn't get too high and um, it has these stems and wherever the stem touches the ground, it will send out new leaves. It has tiny little leaves about this big, they're kind of scalloped. Um, they, if you crush them, they have, some people say they smell like petroleum. They can have a very um, 
or it's in a mint family, right? It's kind of like an oily, unpleasant uh, smell. Eventually, they'll make a blue flower. It will creep into just about everything. The sad part is, of course, that um, it blooms pretty early in spring and the pollinators love it. Wouldn't you know it, right? The bees love it. But um, yeah, it's not fun. You usually find it in your grass. Um, it will take over. Um, you know, once you start pulling it, you'll, you'll get like that whole whole string. The trouble is if you leave those roots in, um, then um, yeah, not such a good idea. What I will do is I will, with my follow-up, I will send you a picture of both garlic, I'm writing this down, of both garlic mustard and creeping Charlie, just so that you can tell the difference. And there's another question. Yes. Could you repeat the uh, recipe for the boric acid mixture? Sure. I, I will. How about I just include it into the um, into the notes? But it, that sounds perfect. Ten ounces of boric acid, of borax. Four ounces of warm water. So then you have a slurry. Then you mix that into two and a half gallons of water, and that is enough to cover an area of 1,000 square feet. Um, so that's the other thing that you need to do. You need to do some multiplication there, right? To figure out how many feet you're trying to cover, right? So don't go spraying that onto 50 square feet because you're gonna have yourself some trouble. Any other questions? I think we're good for the moment. Okay, so rubbing alcohol, good. The other ones, be careful with them. Okay, so how does this, and, and other things too, I just wanted to show you that because I, I have mentioned this um, in, in other presentations too, you know, some of these things that will, will um, that are touted to be antifungal. So how does this work? So, and if you ever have a chance to take a class on um, plant pathology, or just on fungi, I would highly recommend it because they are just absolutely fascinating. Just, I mean, there's a whole world out there that we have no knowledge. It's just absolutely mind blowing. So the leaves, all the leaves have these things called stoma. They're little holes. And you see that round thing around them? Those are called guard cells. And they can, um, the tension in these guard cells will vary. So they can open up and that way, you know, the plant can um, take up gases and a lot of water gets released through them. That's how a, how a plant um, transpires. But of course, since it's a hole, something else can get in there too, right? So here is a, a spore of a disease. And what it does is it germinates and it sends out these tentacles. And these tentacles, well, are called hyphae. And they go through the outer layer, the epidermis of the, of the leaf. And then they start going inside of the leaf. They start wiggling their way alongside all the plant cells. And then eventually what they will do is their little hyphae will actually invade the different cells. And this is of course then how this whole fungus can um, multiply. And that's how you're gonna see, um, you know, the pathology of this particular disease, you know, by, by leaf discoloration. When you see, for instance, powdery mildew, you know, on the surface of the leaf, what you're seeing there is the actual mushroom. That's the fruiting body. That's the part of the, of the um, fungus that is going to release new spores, just like a mushroom would. But this is essentially what happens. And so when you are, when you are using things like, um, like baking soda, what you're doing is, you're, you're, you're spraying something onto that leaf surface that makes it less hospitable for these spores to take hold and to start penetrating that leaf. So 
that's essentially what you're doing. They're not gone, you know, especially not the ones that were there. You're not killing them. They just can't really multiply. But um, yeah, absolutely fascinating stuff. So the other thing is um, something that was not in my picture, but um, they've also done research just like with, with baking soda, right? There's also a lot of people we use milk to try to kill um, uh, fungal diseases. And what they found was, e so milk doesn't really kill any fungal diseases, but look at this. What it is good at is actually killing viruses. And as we all know, there really is nothing out there <laughs> to kill a virus. Yay. <laughs> yeah, learned that the hard way, right? Um, so you can see they have done research. See, this is the kind of stuff that I like. They've done research all over the world um, with different kinds of milk, non-fat, evaporated, got those, whatever, you know. And um, you can see uh, basically, um, that full cream, yeah, but who wants to really do the full cream, right? Um, is pretty darn good at um, controlling viruses in various um, plants. That's a good thing to know, for instance, for your tomatoes, right? Because they get, and, and um, tobacco, because they could get tomato uh, mosaic virus and there's really nothing you can do. So, um, yeah. So they protect them. So with all these things is you do need to spray them. The same thing with um, um, the baking soda. You do need to get at this before the disease takes hold because otherwise, you know, everything is lost. And um, they may also, milk may also decrease the... Um, the instance of powdery mildew. Um, and that is basically because it makes um, a more hospitable environment for benign microorganisms that might um, help with fighting those types of things. Okie dokie, any questions? I just thought that that was interesting because I didn't know there was anything out there that might actually protect a leaf from a virus. Learn something every day, right? Okay. Here's a whole other list of, of things that people will use. Pine needles. Now, why do we use them? They're great mulch. But then, of course, we also think, oh, they come from a conifer. So we really shouldn't use them around our non-acid-loving shrubs or plants because um, they will lower the pH. Not so. They're fantastic mulch. Um, they actually do a really good job at um, suppressing weeds. And of course they break down very slowly because they are so waxy, um, but apparently they do not lower the pH. So once again, if you need to lower the pH, um, you know, go with sulfur, not with pine needles. Peat moss, ah, there is a nicely controversial one, right? Peat moss is in so much of our potting soils and it is definitely touted as something that you should add to your clay to um, improve drainage in the soil. And um, yeah, it's like one of these magical ingredients. Well, here's the trouble. Peat moss is mined, right? It took forever. It took hundreds, thousands of years for these peat bogs to develop. So if they get harvested to go, you know, either in a bag, just total peat moss or into um, potting soils, that is a, a, a resource that is gone forever, you know? So that, that, that just philosophically, I have a little issue with. The other thing is that if you um, dig a hole, right, and to plant something, first of all, the hole should never be deeper than the plant. It should always be at, surf as at level. 
and it should be twice as wide as the plant. But if you start amending that soil, what you do is you create that nice little, very, very comfortable little zone. And chances are that the roots of that newly planted plant are never going to venture out out of that nice little comforting area that you created. So then you're gonna have a plant with a compromised root system, right? Because really rich soil, really nicely amended, the roots go out and they hit something not so nice. And those roots think, yeah, let me just go this way and that way. I'll just stick around here. Not only that, if the drainage between those two areas is very different, what you will do is when it rains, where your plant is, you will have just created a swimming pool because all that water will drain right there and just stay there. And we'll get back to that um, when we, we talk about potted plants. So, um, and the same is that that's definitely true for peat moss. If you, um, if you, if you amend your soil where you're gonna plant something just with peat moss, you will create a little pool. Um, it is, of course, that is acidic. So you might change um, the pH. And on top of that, it has very few nutrients in it. You are much better off with adding compost on top of your, um, on top of your plants that will do a lot more to create a good environment, to improve drainage, to um, encourage beneficial microbes than it is to um, add peat. And not only that, um, there are reports out there that will say that once peat gets really dry, once it has totally dried out, then when it does rain, rather than absorbing the rain, it will actually repel it. So we don't want that in our, in our area. Ah, compost tea, there we go. People will swear by it, right? Sadly, um, the research just isn't out there. There are too many variables to support um, the benefits of compost tea. And in fact, it could actually harbor things like E. coli. So if you're gonna douse your plants, especially your vegetable plants with a compost tea, yeah, you may just really be poisoning yourself. So let's not do that. Um, so, so don't spray it onto your plants. I mean, so much depends on, on what you have put in there, you know, what that concoction becomes. So then of course, um, people started aerating it and said, oh, that improves it so much better. You know, that, that makes it so much safer. Nope. Nope. Research, it just does not support it. Some people will use it, um, to, um, say, well, it will improve the microbes in our soil. You now, won't spray it on the plants, but we will water our plants with it. Well, guess what? If your soil is of such that the microbes don't live there naturally, you can put them in there, but guess what? They're gonna die because the environment doesn't support them. Somebody actually, um, you know, if, if, if you try to put this like in a desert, right, where there's nothing there, well, you can put all the microbes in the world in there, but they're just not going to survive. So that is exactly what is going on. So once again, is the magic word here, because what you really want to do is you want to improve the environment. And then the microbes and all the good stuff will come naturally. And, um, you know, people believe in this. And of course you can buy compost tea now for a lot of money. So uh -uh, just go buy compost or make your compost and forget about the compost tea. Okay, so something I didn't know, something I have said often, um, you know, don't use freshly chipped wood as mulch. Well, I mean, obviously don't use like gigantic amounts um, because it will like rob the soil of nitrogen while it breaks down. Well, what I learned is while it will tie up some of the nitrogen in the very top layer of the soil, 
apparently it doesn't really extract a whole heck of a lot of nitrogen from the soil. So um, if you were to do this um, around well-established plants, apparently that's okay. It may negatively affect like newly planted stuff or ten, you know, annuals, things that are that are a little bit more more tender. But apparently, it doesn't really um, extract a lot of nitrogen out of the soil and seriously negative negatively affect your plants. So I thought that that was uh, that that was interesting. Learn something every day. Um, I still think it's it's better to. Um, you know, for other things, just just like for instance, you know, the weed seeds that might be in there to compost and age it. But um, the science, you know, this is what the science says. Now, coffee grounds. Oh, apparently there's a whole world out there of people who, um, you know, like to give their plants some coffee. Well, they've done research and Apparently, well, it's interesting. Coffee can affect plants in very different ways. Some plants will apparently respond fairly positively to coffee, for instance, lettuce, um, but other things like alfalfa and clover. Um, so those are in the, um, in the legume family, not so happy. And especially rye, wheat, and tomatoes were proven to be negatively infect, you know, affected by coffee grounds. Um, and if they are fresh, they could indeed tie up some, some nitrogen when they, um, when they decompose. Now, people will use these around acid love plants, thinking that they provide a nice jolt of, you know, of acid and that they will lower the pH. Um, actually, they found mixed results. They found that sometimes, yes, the coffee grounds can be um, very acidic, but sometimes they're not, surprisingly enough. And also their effect is not very lasting. So it may temporarily do something, but it doesn't, you know, for the long run. So once again, if you need to lower the pH of your soil, you are better off using sulfur than coffee grounds. So now that is not to say um, that if it works for you, you know, fine. Um, it has, it, there may be some disease suppression when you, when you use coffee grounds. And um, the other thing that it does um, is that because it is an organic compound, what happens is, is the earthworms come because they feed off of it. And they, of course, are digging around in the soil. So actually what you're doing is you are improving the soil drainage. And this may be like the side effect, right? You're improving the soil, the soil drainings, the, the composition of the soil, because the earthworms are feeding off of your coffee grounds. Generally, the advice that I found is if you have coffee grounds, it's better to incorporate it into your compost and then use it then straight up. But um, I know some of you like to put that around your azalea um, shrubs, fine. What it does, since it is what they call allelopathic, right? So some, some plants don't really um, are negatively affected by it. It may inhibit some seed germination and it may also suppress weeds. So you know, if this works around your azalea shrub, by all means. Okay, last one in this list, um, sand added to clay, right? We have our clay, we say, oh, we got to do something. And so let's add sand because that seems to be, right? Makes sense. It's the opposite of clay. So let's mix the two together and we will come up with something really nice. Well, not so. I should have put in my family picture here of the um, um, clay brick making pit in Colonial Williamsburg because sand and clay makes brick. And then you're really, really in, um, yeah, not, not a good situation. So if you have clay, forget about the sand. Compost, once again, is the magic word. We have a lot of fun when our kids were small, standing in the clay, 
you know, and stomping in the sand and yeah, made very nice bricks. So you don't want that in your yard. Okay, now here's one that I am sure so many of us have done. We like to add gravel to the bottom of our flower pots because we think it will increase drainage. Ah, on the contrary, it actually diminishes drainage. What they found was, you know, by the wonders of gravity, what they found is that water actually, if you have this nice, there we go, right here. Do you see that? Oh, little waves of water, right? So apparently water has a very tough time migrating from your potting soil into your gravel. So what it will do instead, rather than draining out, it will pull right here. And so that will cause your roots to rot. So you are actually um, achieving the opposite. So um, forget about the gravel. Um, if you, um, a lot of people want to add the gravel because they say, well, otherwise my soil drain, you know, leaves my pot. Well, what I, what I, what I do, sure, if you just put potting soil in a new pot, yeah, some of it will escape to the bottom. So what I do is I just put it in a saucer, right? I fill up my pot and then whatever fell through, well, I can take the saucer off, put it back on the top, problem solved. And your roots, of course, have way more room to grow than if there's all this gravel in there. Um, and of course, you know, as we are getting older, we may be not that strong anymore. So guess what? A pot with gravel, really heavy. So then you're gonna need all kinds of extra help to move your flower pots. Um, some people will add gravel to their flower pots because they say, well, otherwise my flower pots will um, fall over in doing storms. Well, then it may be the case that your plant has gotten top heavy and that actually you need to move it into a bigger pot. So forget about the gravel, total garden myth. It just is a bit harder on your back and um, does not improve the drainage in your pot. Who knew, right? Garden myth debunked. There we go. Here's another one. And it has to do with trees. So general advice is always, always, always stake your trees, right? When you are planting a new tree. Well, maybe not so, because here is the thing. Why can't I find my So um, if you are going to stake your trees, what you should do is it should be really loosely because guess what? As the top part, of your tree sways in the wind, it will actually encourage the roots. It, it gives a signal to the roots and says, hey, you better start growing. So if you stake this sucker to the point where it really is just, you know, it can't move, actually not encouraging those roots to grow. So then when you take your stakes off, you still have a plant that's gonna flop out of the ground. So you only need to do this if really, if you live in a high wind area, if you had a very tall tree that, that maybe is, you know, you just feel like it isn't really anchored very well. And then of course, don't forget to take it off after one season, one season, that's all it takes. Um, and because otherwise, right, your the, the tree is gonna grow and then you get this nice situation where your ties, you know, right? The tree will actually have, the wood will have grown around your ties and then you're constricting water conduction in your plant. So one season, one season only, and only if it really truly is necessary. And then loosely, what you wanna do is you wanna keep the tree from blowing over completely. You do not want the tree to not move at all because it's just not good. And then I think none of us are doing this, but I thought I would just throw this out here. Um, 
painting uh, pruning wounds because people say, oh, you know, there's a wound. And of course we like to cover our wounds when we have a wound. Um, yeah, you know, it seems to help us. So, you know, and anthropomorphic as we are, we think, oh, let's put that on a cut uh, of a tree too. Well, nope. Research has found that actually what you're doing is you're trapping all kinds of pathogens underneath here. Pathogens can creep underneath here and it's a perfect seal for stuff to grow. So any, you know, pruning paints, whatever the heck you have, throw it out, not good. You're just inducing more diseases. A tree is perfectly capable of healing that wound all by itself, doesn't need a Band-Aid like we do. Um, and um, it just only does it harm. And of course, the other advice that's out there is when you, when you transplant something, um, you know, you just dug it up, it has a lot of foliage. So in order to help it get reestablished, right, cut it back because then there's less leaves for that plant to support. Well, also not good advice because in all the outer parts and all the tips of those branches of whatever it is that you just moved is a hormone called auxin and it suppresses the, gro the, the, the growth of the side shoots. If you prune that out, you have just removed that hormone. And when that hormone is removed, that is a sign to the plant to put out new growth. So you just transplanted something. It has a seriously compromised root system. Chances are most of the roots are still at the old spot. Um, so it really has very little, you know, it doesn't have enough roots to pick up water and nutrients. Then if you take the hormone that suppresses growth away from the top growth, and you're telling this plant, please start growing, how the heck is the plant gonna do that? It doesn't have enough roots to support that. So you're doing more harm than good. Yes, your plant will wilt. Yes, it will leaves. That's a natural, normal um, mechanism. You may eventually end up with some dieback. You can prune that out later, but it will be gentler on the plant to do that than to cut it back and tell it to grow when it really cannot support all that um, stimulation. <laughs> okay. So that was a little thing about pruning and trees and God knows whatever. Then, oh yay, companion planting. Gosh, I could do a whole talk just about companion planting. Um, so I'm not gonna do that here, but let me just say, um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Probably one of the um, um, most um, interesting myths out there is that marigolds um, shoo away bunnies, right? So if you have a vegetable garden and you have bunnies in your garden, oh, plant a whole parameters, parameter of marigolds and you will not have any bunnies. Yeah, hmm. Once again, in some instances, sure, the bunnies stayed away. In other instances, the marigolds actually attracted the bunnies. Uh, so God only knows, right? So not such a good idea. Now, marigolds, um, only the French marigolds, um, do, um, they, they will kill nematodes um, in your soil. So if you have a problem with nematodes, one species, of marigolds will actually help with that. Um, they do need to grow there for a whole season. And then you need to make sure you incorporate it into the soil. Um, so, so that's a good thing. So um, this book, The Plant Partners, um, that just came out in December of 2020. I just requested it from the library because yay, the library has it. So I am very much looking forward to, um, to this to this publication. Carrots Love Tomatoes, that's one of the popular books out there. I think, um, you know, it's also older. I think you may wanna, wanna 
do some research if you're going to use that because there's not you know not everything in there um, is is really proven to be true. One of the publications that I do find is very helpful when it comes to companion planting whoop, is that one. Um, and I can definitely um, include that with the PDF um, in the follow-up. It has a lot of very good information in it. Um, some companion planting <clears throat> will actually venture into something called um, macrobiotics. And that's a whole different um, interesting philosophy that has to do with crystals and God knows whatever. And it's definitely not scientifically proven to be true. So um, you may want to take that with a serious, serious grain of salt. Um, so where do you get all this information, right? Well, um, here are some really, really good resources. Um, you see the three books down here. Um, they were all written by um, Jeff Gilman. Don't request them all straight from the library because I have them here at home, but I'll return them either today or tomorrow to the library. But um, Jeff Gilman, he is, um, he works at the moment um, at the University of North Carolina at the Charlotte Botanical Gardens. He was a uh, professor um, of plant science at the University of Minnesota. Um, he is a seriously, seriously uh, learned guy. And um, his advice, I mean, it is science-based. It is researched. It is very good stuff. And then um, the other resource um, is this very interesting woman, Linda Chalker Scott. I really like this plant, how plants work, how this, this book, how plants work. Um, gosh, plants are just so fascinating. And um, so I will send you this link too, because there's a lot of PDFs here in, in her, um, on her website that is all about horticultural myths. And then she is also one of the um, people who is part of this blog called The Garden Professors. And you can actually subscribe to that blog and um, you know, you'll get their posts and stuff like that about all the fun things that they debunk. Because of course, you know, science is forever progressing and um, you know, new stuff comes up and people do research and then they can tell us all about it. And there you go. So that was all that I had to say. I tried to, I mean, there's so much information out there. I kind of tried to pick the things that I thought were maybe less obvious or things that were really obvious that people should stop doing. So, um, oh, here's another one. I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. Do not fertilize things in um, plants while it's really hot. And I thought, well, duh, because, um, you know, the plant, you know, that just seems counterintuitive to me. What I didn't know, see, here's where the science is fun, is that fertilizers contain a lot of salts. And salts, of course, you know, they tie up the water. They're very good at attracting water. So then they prohibit the plants from taking up water. So instead of helping the plant, you are actually then inducing extra stress because those fertilizers are tying up the water and the plant can't take it up. So um, who knew, um, you know, then the plant needs extra water. So if you hit, if you hit a dry spell, um, not so fantastic. Okay, well, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that I could actually see the chat box. And we do have a couple questions that are follow-ups to what you were saying earlier. Um, okay. And also, I, I put a note in the chat that if anyone is interested in requesting the books that Sabine mentioned, please do so. Um, even, oh, yeah, if she's, even if she still has them checked out, we can put you on a list for them. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, they're, they're, going, they're going back. I mean, they will be back before Monday. 
no pressure. Um, no, there the, is no pressure. The the uh, the two questions that came in related to what you were talking about earlier. One is about whether you should spray tomatoes with milk. Yes, I see that. Well, that is a good question. Um, I don't know. It, it you know once again that depends. Have you had problems in the past um, with viruses on your tomatoes? Most of the time, what you have on your tomatoes actually fungal diseases, right? Early blight, late blight, septoria blight. Um, so I am not sure that uh, milk is really gonna do it because those are not viruses. Um, if you have a problem with um, fungal diseases on your tomatoes, um, I, I would do different things. I would do, um, I would first of all, make sure that you mulch the soil because a lot of this, you know, will splash and in particles of the soil and go then to your plants. So first of all, mulch the soil around your tomato plant. The less splashing, the better. Second of all, at the first instance that you see um, a disease, and usually starts at the lower leaves, clip, you know, a tomato, unless it's a determined one, but most tomato, a lot of tomatoes are indeterminate. So cut off those lower leaves, you know, gone, put them in, put them in the garbage can, then you've just taken the pathogen away altogether. When you water your tomatoes, it's much better to uh, use drip irrigation than to overhead water them because, you know, we, tomatoes leaves are hairy. So then they will hold on to this water and they will become a nice little incubator sp space for all these fungal diseases. So don't, you know, try not to get the leaves of your tomato plants wet. And then if all else fails, right, because we don't control um, the weather. So we could have a very, as we've had a very wet season, you know, even though you are not overhead watering, mother nature is. Um, and then, you know, these diseases get carried on, on on the wind. They come from, a lot of them come from the south and, you know, then they just go from one vegetable garden to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, so if all else, else fails, I would then go to things like um, um, organic fungicides like, like copper or like serenade, stuff, which is a, a bacteria that fights, um, naturally found that fights uh, fungal diseases. And what you wanna do, I mean, if you really have a serious disease is um, you actually wanna alternate. So, because if you use the same thing over and over again, well, first of all, you don't wanna do that with copper because it's a heavy metal, um, but it's better when you have diseases to alternate treatments um, so that the fungus just gets very confused and can't take hold and become resistant. So, so that's what I would do. I would first start with a lot of cultural practices and then only as a last resort, um, you know, go to organic fungicides. And what, I've, what I'm doing this year, I had just such a terrible, terrible, terrible um, tomato year last year. And um, so this year I am just sadly forgoing my heirlooms, um, even though there are some heirlooms out there that have some disease resistance. And I have gone to hybrids that have a very high instance of disease resistance to the particular diseases that have been plaguing my tomatoes, because I just feel like I need to break the cycle. So, um, so, you know, there's always, thank heavens, um, disease resistant varieties that you can plant. So, so that's what I, that's what I would do. Unless you know that you have had issues with viruses in your, in your um, worm casting tea, you know, I'd have to do research. I don't know, but I would say it's probably the same. Um, I would definitely, um, I don't know, I'd have to have to do some research. So I, I shall do so and let you know. With all these teas, um, I would never ever 
put them on anything that I would consume because um, even if they don't harbor um, harmful path, harmful bacteria or, or you know, harf, harmful organisms, just by putting something on a leaf that has stuff in it, right? You could be creating an environment that might be nice for harmful pathogens, organisms. So um, I don't know, I think I would just use it as a compost or maybe, you know, put it with my plantings. Um, I am not, I'm not sure, I'll do some research. So, um, speaking of Epsom salt, gosh, I don't know. I would say um, if you have, so th the question is, um, should I put it on my Christmas cactus monthly because it needs magnesium? Is this true? First of all, I have no idea whether a Christmas cactus needs magnesium. So I have to uh, look that up. Uh, and it probably goes to the myth that it will make a plant bloom better. Well, that has been proven not to be so. Um, and then of course, you have put that in a pot, right? So I'd like to think you have used some sort of well-balanced potting soil. So guess what? Then it shouldn't really need magnesium, right? Because you have used a well-balanced potting soil. Um, so I'll do some research on that one as well. Any problem with garden torches? So this would be burning your weeds, right? Uh, no, they work, but they burn the top. So um, if you have a very um, persistent weed with a nice tap root, it will be gone for a little while, but then eventually will come back. So yes, they, they do work, you know, there uh, lots of people um, use them and um, yes, it's, it's fine for, for burning off things, but if you think you're gonna like do away forever with your wire grass or with your um, chicory or something like that, no. That's not gonna happen, but you know, and don't don't set your house on fire either, just for the fun of it. You know, don't don't do it when we have a drought. That may just not be the greatest idea. Okay, the Eastern Shore Land Conservancy is hosting a webinar on carbon sequestering on the Del Marva. Awesome. There's a lot. Um... Ah, calcium. Calcium, calcium, calcium. Yes, calcium on tomatoes. There is, um, right, because we all want to find blossom and rot. And oh my goodness, all the things I found out about eggshells, right? Put eggshells um, on your, you know, with your tomatoes to fight blossom and rot. And um, because that's a calcium deficiency. You have to, it, it's fine. It's not going to harm you or anything. You do have to use quite a bit of eggshells. But the bigger issue here, once again, is it is not a, it's not a cure. The bigger issue is that calcium moves through the plant at a slower pace than water for, and, and other things. So when you get blossom and rot on your tomatoes, it is usually because of either we have done serious inconsistent watering, right? So that all of a sudden the plant gets a jolt of water, the water moves through the, through the tomato, the calcium can't keep up and, um, and that's how you get blossom and rot. This often happens early in the season because temperature plays a role too. The colder it is, um, the more chance you have of blossom and rot. And then the other thing is some plants, especially heirlooms and especially um, uh, paste tomatoes, they are just naturally prone to blossom and rot. So um, 
there's almost a, a no-win situation there. So the best cure for, for blossom and rot is A, don't plant your tomatoes too early, and B, make sure that you have consistent watering. So once again, here's where drip irrigation comes in really, really well, right? Water your plants, water them deeply, um, you know, so that they have enough water and that the calcium and the water are moving through your tomatoes at the same pace. Obviously, once again, we can't control mother nature. So if we get these torrential downpours, then even during the hottest part of the season, even though the temperature doesn't really uh, play that much of a role in blossom and rot again, if we get, you know, four inches of rain in a day, yeah, then all bets are off. So if you then had just developing um, tomatoes, yes, you may get some extra blossom and rot. So doesn't make, you know, if it's not too bad, it doesn't make the tomato inedible, makes it unsellable, but you're not gonna sell them anyway. So you're gonna eat them, right? Just cut it off, very simple. So um, so yeah, do you, you can do your eggshells. Um, now, eggshells are also a hot commodity in all kinds of other ways. Um, so I just got, you know, I got a link with eggshells to actually grind them up and like use them as toothpaste and all kinds of other things. Now, if that advice is out there, and it doesn't tell you to actually like sterilize these suckers and you know put them in the oven, then that's bad advice because you know, hello salmonella. So do be a little careful what you do with your eggshells, right? Um, yeah. Um, feeding them back to your chickens, yeah, they need to be, they need to be sterilized too first. Otherwise, not such a good idea. There you go. Any other questions? So, yes, no, you may also also speak or type, or if you think about it later, tonight when you're taking a shower, right? Um, just, just holler, just send me an email and I will happily answer your questions. Um, I will definitely follow up about the question about the worm casting tea, whether Christmas cactus need magnesium, and I will send, oh, and I'll send you pictures of the garlic mustard and the creeping Charlie, and I will also send you a whole bunch of links or and PDFs um, so that you can, you can at leisure read about the science about all this kind of stuff and what they what they have done and um, in terms of debunking all this stuff. So um, so there you go. So um, you need to start for making muffins or something, right? The same. We're thank you so, so much for thank this. Thank you, very good information, thank you. Well, thank you, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yay. You are welcome. I'm Bye. glad to see so many people here. As a librarian, I have to say that debunking information and making sure accurate information is in the world just warms my heart. So I thank you even more than usual. Oh, <laughs> okay. No, I, I do too. You know, it's, it's, you know, science is a beautiful thing. It's out there for a reason, right? We don't just want to do crazy stuff. So. Agreed. <laughs> Again, thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Same to you.